Hello again, Rabbi. Morning, Joe. And again, we have Stacy as a special guest. Welcome, Stacy. Good morning, everybody. And Stacy, you have a question about Jewish culture, and I will let you ask it. Sure. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, so any culture, there's five hallmarks. And when I say hallmarks, I'm not talking about the Hallmark Channel. I'm talking about like the key pillars that kind of help move the culture along and create it. One is language, one is heritage, one is customs, and the last two are arts and family. And I know that customs and heritage are super important in the Jewish religion and culture. So Rabbi, I have a question for you. Why are customs so important and why do we need rules in religion? God bless the heretics, Stacy. I wanna start with that because without any heretics, no society would have moved forward. Now, you can't have a heretic without having rules, because if there are no rules, how do you know you're breaking them or asking for change? And it's important for a culture to establish a system of some kind that will promote the values and the ideals without them getting lost or getting watered down so that you don't know what they mean. On the other side is they become so extreme that they don't allow people to be people and they really don't promote the culture. One of the things we wanna look for is ego. And one of the hallmarks of a cult is following the cult leader, regardless of how absurd the statements may be, even if the statements contradict science, even if the statements go against everything we know about the universe. If then it becomes a cult, and we all know what happens to cult members by drinking the Kool-Aid, by putting quarters under their pillows, by whatever they may do, it ends up destroying the culture. So we wanna look at what enhances and helps. And so we have rules and regulations. Then the question becomes, how do we maintain them without them becoming oppressive, without them actually destroying and being truly counterproductive? And we see change, sometimes gradual. Revolutionary change doesn't seem to work. Look at South America. Look all over our planet historically. When we had revolutions, it was worse than what it was before. So we want to look at that's why I like heretics. That's why I like an artist. The goal of the artist is to take us where we've never been, where we're afraid to go, and the artist challenges our perceptions of reality. And I think that's what culture needs. And when I use the word heretic, they're truly artists. They're asking us to look. So who decides what the rules are in a religion? And for Judaism, how might those change over time? Judaism is very unique in that aspect because it's up to me as the rabbi. That's what the word rabbi is. We have no hierarchy, no pope, no cardinal, no bishops. There is no official council or position to say, this is what you must believe. This is what a Jew believes. Anytime a group of Jews gather, they decide rules, regulations, and then they contact, hire, associate with a rabbi whose views and opinions reflect theirs, which is why it's very difficult when people say to me, what do Jews believe about? I always give five opinions, five views, and that's to simplify it. I could give many more because there isn't the central authority. There's no Baltimore catechism. There's no Pope Cardinal. There's no synod. And so communities develop and the rabbi becomes the teacher, the individual to interpret the rules. Unfortunately, I don't have any police. And that really makes me sad. I really would like to have uh, it, the enforcers so that when I make a pronouncement I, and someone doesn't follow it, I can just call in the, my enforcers. Remember, I'm from Boston, and I did work for the family when I was younger. So I really like that model, to be able to make a rule 
and then if someone violates it. If someone is not following the rules, as a rabbi, we use teachings, we use arguments, we ask questions. I have no authority to ban, demand, no rabbi does. We don't have a, a provision for excommunication. There's no way. That's why heretics in Judaism are even more important than other heretics because they can't be thrown away. They can't be excommunicated. They can't be sidelined. We have to address what they're saying. And that I think is a plus for society, addressing challenges to the rules. So you can't even use the Jewish space laser. I have, wait a minute. Oh, since you mentioned it, and this it really was an answer to my prayer, Stacy, because I now have the authority to clamp down on those that challenge my rules. I must remember now to wear my aluminum foil hat when I go outside. So I have another rule question for you, not related to lasers and not related to uh, a police force per se, but everyone is obviously very passionate about food. So why are there so many rules and regulations associated with food in Judaism? Does that stem from teachings in the Torah? There are two distinct schools. Actually, there are many more, as I mentioned, but we've, it falls into two distinct groups. Those who look at the dietary restrictions in the Torah and in the Talmud as public health, given a society, given a time without refrigeration, without the FDA, without food being inspected, it was necessary to establish health rules and the only way they could be enforced was to tell people God commanded you. God commanded you to draw your fresh water upstream from the latrines. God commanded you to clean your house. God commanded you not to eat certain foods. Now, if you look at the list, they're all foods that are very dangerous. And without proper refrigeration, slaughtering, they would lead to health and disease. And so there's a distinct school that looks at all our regulations and says, it's really obvious that this is about public health. Then there's a school that looks at it and says, of course, it's for public health. God commanded it. What God commanded us to be healthy and safe. And God also wanted us to be careful about where we ate and with whom we associated. And God didn't want us to be sitting at a table where we may be served food that not intentionally would poison us, but would intentionally get everyone sick. And so there are those that see the dietary restrictions as God-centered, and there are those that see it as public health and safety, and that God was attached since we don't have a police force. So the question now you want to ask, Stacey, is now that we have the FDA now that we have proper dietary and, and all kinds of things going on, why would we want to continue? Now we're back to your culture question, because this is something that we identify with. I just want to point out that every time I hear the FDA issue a statement, it's about vegetables. Don't eat this vegetable. Don't go, don't get the salad here. Don't get the salad there. It's very rare. I hear them telling me not to get a burger at a fast food place, but I do hear the FDA telling me not to order a salad because of salmonella, which leads me to believe that being a vegetarian may be dangerous to your health and it's much safer to be an omnivore, which is what we as human beings are. So now we're back to your culture question. And the, we can look at and accept both, both the definitions. Historically, it was for public health, not necessary anymore. God commanded in order to prospect the bodies that are created in his image. So we can combine both of them and there really is no conflict. And you don't have to be strict. You can do dietary at home or in restaurants or any forms mixing. And it's all okay because the goal is to identify with God and a culture. The goal isn't what I put or don't put in my mouth. That's not, just like the speed limit. Look at the speed limit on the beltway. 
I think it's just a suggestion, Joe. I don't think we have any real speed limits, just like stop signs. I think stop signs are just a suggestion because I watch people. They don't take them seriously. And so rituals are signs to keep us on track. They're not about the goal. The goal is safety. I would remind my listener that all speed limits are weather conditions permitting. And people seem to forget that. The speed limit isn't 65. It's 65 weather permitting. And we automatically want to lower it because the goal isn't to do the ritual. The goal is what does it do to me? How does it help me lead a better life? How does it help me respect my neighbors? How does it help me respect my body? You know, um, and I was vegetarian for seven, eight years. I was macrobiotic in college. I'm not even sure what that means anymore. Uh, go ahead, I was going to ask, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> you can Google being macrobiotic. Now you can. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't even find it in the, the section in the library back when we were in college. But speaking of signs, don't you ever stop, Rabbi. You continue to amaze me with your wisdom and uh, contributions to culture and my education of Judaism. And thank you, Stacy. And we will definitely have to get together again soon. But as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for attending, Stacy. And you definitely do have to come back because I think we have a couple of loose ends we need to tie up. Sounds great. Thank you both. <laughs>